Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Before Corona Apocalypse really got underway, I had been planning a whole list of phenomenal books to read and discuss in March. Sadly, like so many of you, I've read a lot less this month than I had hoped. Existential angst about global events and about some separate personal health challenges got the better of my concentration. I've refreshed the news much too frequently and stared into space too often. And when I did pick up a book, read the same page repeatedly. I've also been checking on friends and family more often. And I have really loved catching up on booktube videos, watching them that is, seeing how all of you are doing, what you're reading and when you're not reading. Thanks for being part of my life. And, unlike some of you, weirdly enough, I'm adjusting to a certain kind of increased social activity. Until a couple of weeks ago, I spent most of my days at home in our small house while my spouse worked in an office on the other side of town. Our son was in another state in college. Now, my husband is teleworking, and our son came home when his college closed the dorms, bringing his wonderful international girlfriend with him. What a pleasure to have them all here. She is a great addition, a film buff, an insightful thinker, a great cook, a calming force in our family life sometimes, and a great barber, as I found out the other night. Still, as an extreme introvert, I have needed some time to adjust to all of our togetherness. We've been reconfiguring our home a bit so all of us can telework and telestudy, a plan which started last week when the kids' week of spring break ended and they started their online classes. Although I'm reading less than I had intended, abandoning a lot of my March TBR, I have found some books that at least sort of work for me right now. And I've been relying on both knitting and baking bread to take me through the times when I have trouble reading. Although even then, it often takes twice as long to do anything, just because I'm not really concentrating. I couldn't even get myself organized to film this Friday Reads video until today. So, I said I found a few books that have more or less worked for me. The first is Biography or Social History, if it's relatively short and written in a story-driven way. I very much enjoyed reading Adam Hostchiel's Rebel Cinderella, From Rags to Riches to Radical, the epic journey of Rose Pastor Stokes. Steve Donahue was kind enough to send me a copy for a review in Open Letters Review, which was so much fun to write. I'll link below to the complete review, but let me describe the book here. Rose Pastor was a Russian Jewish immigrant in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century. After supporting her family through work in a cigar factory, she later began writing newspaper columns for a Jewish paper describing the experiences of laboring immigrants in New York City. There, in a settlement house designed to provide social support for people living in poverty, she interviewed a wealthy man, James Graham Phelps Stokes, who, due to feelings of noblesse oblige, was active in the settlement house movement the two of them quickly fell in love and married, fascinating the whole country with their ability to unite across social and economic class, across the divide between immigrant and native born, across religious and ethnic difference, and across educational barriers. Rose and Graham were active in the burgeoning socialist movement in the United States and other movements on the left including for Rose, the early feminist movement and the fight for birth control. I really enjoyed reading this absorbing study. Host Shield is a wonderful writer, the author of a book I've mentioned before, King Leopold's Ghost, about the Belgian Congo and the story lying behind Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. 
Although Rebel Cinderella is framed around a biography, the book is really a study of the American left, how it started in a moment of great hope and unity early in the 20th century, and how it fractured from internal divisions about pacifism during World War I and about the Bolshevik Revolution, and was demonized by outsiders as unpatriotic and dangerous. The marriage between Rose and Graham was as unable to withstand these fractures as the left was as a whole, although their fairy tale did not end with a happily ever after. We as readers get a picture of a very independent woman with a strong voice and an inspiring commitment to her own beliefs, even when other people disagreed with her. Another biography I read, actually that I listened to on audiobook, which often doesn't work for me, but did for this time for whatever reason, was Mitts by Sigrid Nunez. This is the somewhat fictionalized biography of the Marmoset, cared for by Virginia Woolf and Leonard Woolf. His story gives a really lovely portrait of a difficult time in the Woolf's lives. Nunez limits our view to what the Marmoset saw, but just like Hushell's Rebel Cinderella, Mitz actually gives us a much broader story about the Wolves, about their lives and with their friends on Bloomsbury, and about England as a whole during this period in the face of World War II. The book is wonderfully charming, funny and sweet, but also really sad and serious, talking about the daily lives and personalities of both Virginia and Leonard. I think right now I need that sad and serious feeling to keep me attached to books. Perhaps this is a strange comment, but the quote biography felt intensely as if it were written with great respect or love toward the wolves. Perhaps choosing a beloved pet to be the focus helps encourage that approach. Another sad and serious but warm and thoughtful book I read recently is Catherine Smythe's amazing All the Lives We Ever Lived, Seeking Solace in Virginia Woolf. What a beautiful book, one that I found really mesmerizing, at least until the end, which I felt petered out just a bit. If you're not fairly familiar with Wolf's to the Lighthouse, you might want to read or reread it first. Essentially, Smythe explores her father's illness and death through the lens of To the Lighthouse, borrowing its structure and imagery, as well as its ideas about the complexity of all parts of life, including success and home and grief. Smythe had fallen in love with Virginia Woolf and her works when she was an undergraduate, reading To the Lighthouse for the first time when she was a visiting student at Oxford and then eventually writing her senior thesis under literary scholar Arnold Weinstein, whose wonderful Great Courses lectures I enjoyed with my son when he was a homeschooled high schooler. I love the magical way Smythe weaves together her own family story, the biography of Virginia Woolf, and literary analysis of the novel. If you're a fan of Wolf, or if you're a reader of memoirs about either parent-child relationships or about grief, you might find this book to be a source of solace, just as I did in this time. I mentioned in a previous tag that one of my um, organizing strategies for books was piles on the floor and on desks. Well, with four of us teleworking in the house, I really needed to spend some time last week sorting through some of those piles to make room for my son to do some writing and other schoolwork. While I was straightening, I listened to a short audiobook written by Robert McFarlane, author of Underland and The Old Ways, both books I really want to read. The audiobook I listened to was The Lost Words, an attempt to remind readers young and old of words that are in danger of disappearing as our hold on the natural world gets looser and looser. The book is based on the fact that the Oxford Junior Dictionary dropped dozens of words in its 2015 version. 
McFarlane presents poems to mark these words in our hearts, words that I think today's adults might be stunned to think our future grandchildren or great-grandchildren might not use. Daily words like acorn, dandelion, willow, raven, starling, wren, but I don't really think McFarlane is talking about an actual loss of these words. He's talking about the loss of our regular experience of nature, of wildness. The idea is heartbreaking in a wistful way about a world that is disappearing. And reading a book like this at a time when our own kind of world is transforming felt just right. Honestly, I'd love to see a physical copy of McFarland's book, something I suspect I won't be able to do until our local library reopens, I hope, at the end of this crisis. I gather the book is filled with lovely illustrations. The audio includes music and background sounds to try to share that same kind of mood, but I suspect I'd prefer the physical visual. One more thing to discuss. In most of my recent videos about what I'm reading, I've been talking about particular book reviews I've read recently. Today, I want to mention the lovely editorial introduction in the Times Literary Supplement, where Stig Abel thanks his team and explains that this week's issue was the first in more than a century of publication to be edited completely by people working remotely from their homes. As he points out, the TLS and other book reviews, while never completely relying, have always worked using the collected wisdom of authors from all around the globe, originally using the mail, but now digitally. That feeling of continuity and comfort came at just the right time for me. I hope you too will be able to find joy in not only books, but the bookish community here on BookTube and more broadly. Thanks for joining me today on Hannah's Books. See you soon.